89.9 KMOJ, the people station. Today's R&B and throwbacks. It's Glam Life Kim, and right now it is 101. And on the phone lines, I have one of my very special friends, Mr. Anthony Taylor. It's time for Minneapolis 360. How are you today? I am good today, Glam Life Kim. It has been a while since we have been on the air, so it is definitely good to hear your voice, and be with you again today. How have you been, sis? I have been blessed. I'm feeling better, so I'm so happy, and I thank God that I'm I'm able to be here with you and that I'm feeling better. Yeah, That's that's perfect, too, and I'm I'm, I'm glad. You know, since we're doing this virtually, it's kind of hard to be in person, but I'm really missing your outfits, sis, so I really (laughs) – Talking about your outfits, I mean, I, I miss seeing that. Hold so. on, you got to see my mask, though. My mask okay. right now is vicious. <laughs> I, I, I believe it. you. Got to you got to post it on the Camel J website so okay. people can see it. I so would I do would that. To it too. <laughs> Welcome everybody to Minneapolis 360. It has been a while since we have been on. We've taken a few weeks off just to get adjusted. Uh, I want to make sure folks understand that we will be here. Uh, But in the interim, we had to make sure that things were right. And there's a lot going on in our community. So I want to thank you for tuning in. I am always blessed to be having this show and and being part of what I think are hopefully good information and good resources to people, as we always been giving you for the last uh, year and a half. So I want to thank you for being here. Uh, I think one of the, the things that I thought was important today was to talk about what's going on in our city. Uh, We experienced a devastating uh, travesty, tragedy uh, with the death of George Floyd and how that's turned into a movement throughout the world. But as we all know, you know, these are cumulative effects on on some of the things that we feel that's been happening uh, for us as as Black folks in our country. So what I wanted to do is, is bring a guest on to talk a lot today about historical trauma uh, and how it shows up in our community, some signs and symptoms, uh, and really talk about healing with trauma uh, and what exactly a historical trauma is. We've talked about this before in Minneapolis, but it's always, I think, good to come back to these reminders about what some of those things look like and how things are, are, are affecting you in your body that you may not even know uh, exists. Uh, if you remember, we had Resma Minikin come on last year after we had the tragedy with Thurman Blevins. So I got a, a special guest. I'll introduce her in a second. Uh, but one thing I want to make sure we do understand that COVID is still alive in Minneapolis. So again, as we've been doing for the last four months, is just give you a, some real quick updates on what's going on and with the COVID numbers. We are, are at 33 uh, 1,763 confirmed cases uh, in Minnesota, 4,390 of those are in Minneapolis. And out of all of those are tested, are 21% to be African-American statewide. In the city, it is 32. So we are still kind of in a holding pattern, so to speak. Earlier, we were really spiking every week when the show was weekly. But again, I want to remind folks to continue to wear their masks, stay safe in public, uh, and Kim, I think one of the things that, that I've been seeing that that's really been uh, uh, something that's uh, filled my heart is that with a lot of the, the protests and rallies, there are a lot of people out there that are wearing masks. And I see it a lot. I don't mm-hmm. know if you see that, too. Mm-hmm. or been hearing about that as yes, well. Yes, they have been. They have and been, it's, which is great. It's, it's beautiful. And I, and I was actually in New Salem yesterday volunteering for the testing site. So there were a lot of people coming up, walking up for testing awesome. and wearing masks. So um, I'm glad to see that. But just real quick, some more information with the peacetime emergency uh, with uh, Tim Waltz has extended. So that still means that you have protections against evictions and wage garnishments. There's a lot of things that are opening up. So I know businesses have plans about in place to, to keep people safe. So evictions and landlord and, and tenant uh, terminations are now in effect till the 13th of July, which means that you cannot be evicted from your home because of lack of payment. Now, remember, too, also, Minneapolis, you still have to pay your rent. So this doesn't mean right. that rent is not excluded, but you have eviction protections uh, until July 13th. 
And also, too, just remember, it doesn't mean that, that you can't get evicted for, for different things that endangers folks. So, mm-hmm. I mean, you can't be out here doing reckless things in your home or your apartment. You can still get evicted for that and can't blame the, or, or put it on the peacetime right. emergency. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So uh, I am glad that, that we are wearing more masks. There is some more money coming. We've done a lot of different initiatives throughout this time before uh, George Floyd's murder uh, about initiatives with gap funding and things like that for small business and for uh, households. There is a grant coming out this week for small business uh, relief grants, and it's taking applications until July or July 2nd, Thursday. So these grants provide $10,000 to businesses with 50 or fewer full-time employees. So to learn more about that, please go to mn.gov slash deed for that. Again, 50 or fewer full-time employees are eligible for a $10,000 grant. So that's a lot, Minneapolis. Uh, please go to the website and check that out. But I want to introduce my, my special guest today. I am so happy that this sister be able to come on this show, Dr. Lita King. She's a senior clinical psychologist at Hibbon County Medical Center. She is joining us today to talk about historical trauma. Dr. King, welcome and thank you for being a part of Minneapolis 360 today. Welcome, thank Dr. You. King. Thank you for the invitation, beautiful black people. I do want to point out, though, that um, although I am with Hennepin County, um, I'm at North Point Health and Wellness Center over in North Minneapolis now. Oh, wow. Did spend some time at HCMC, but I'm back over to where I belong at North Point. <laughs> that, that's beautiful. Uh, you back, you back home. That's right, back home. Yeah. <laughs> so, so tell us a little bit about what you do at North Point, Doctor King. Sure. So, uh, as a uh, clinical psychologist, I meet with individuals and families to help them to overcome barriers uh, that um, impede their ability to function in all areas of life. So we look at the spiritual, the um, emotional, the physical well-being of uh, of our community, and try to uh, assist them in uh, creating new ways of being that uh, are more healthy, and allow them to meet their goals in life. And that's something I think that's that's vital in our our community, and especially with with what we're dealing with now as a, as a city and as a society. And, and if we talk about taking care of ourselves, and we talk about trauma, kind of explain what, what you mean when you say trauma and, and like, what's the difference between, or if there is a slight difference between trauma and historical trauma in our community. Sure. So psychological trauma represents an emotional state of discomfort and stress that results from memory or um, are a result of extraordinary or catastrophic experiences. So what it typically does is shatters a survivor's sense of safety. So this could be one event or it could be multiple events. Uh, But what gets disrupted is the person's ability to uh, kind of relax and calm down and believe that they are safe in their existence. So that's trauma in a nutshell, and it's different from historical trauma uh, because historical trauma is the accumulative effects, right? So uh, it's a cumulative emotional and psychological wounding, and you can find this in individuals or groups, and it's caused by traumatic experiences or events. Uh, and this can be any group that ex- has... Um, uh, experienced significant traumatic um, experiences. Examples of that would be enslavement. So Africans coming to America and being enslaved for 400 years, for example. Genocide and uh, ethnic cleansing as we've seen in other parts of the world. And, and that's great that you said that. So, and 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 can you explain a little bit too, like the intergenerational historical trauma in, in that too, as well? When we're talking about sure. an enslavement, you know, and that's really where it stems from. Am I correct? Yes. For, yes. for, for yes. black folks, yes. For black folks, yes. 
So what we know is that just because um, something happened to, let's say, our grandparents um, and uh, they persisted and um, they were able to uh, survive, uh, there are costs to have experienced uh, segregation, um, police brutality, so on and so forth, that gets trickled down to the next generation and the next generation because what has happened is that our people have learned to adapt right uh in order to survive but it's perhaps cost them some things in terms of their ability to feel safe and secure or um their ability uh to relax or um their ability to um be free of uh disease uh chronic diseases and so on so what happens is that um, the the individuals find ways to survive, but oftentimes uh, it does not lend itself to being able to function uh, in a way that other groups have not experienced. So you're you're, you're seeing um, a mom and and and, and grandma operating operating in a way uh, that you don't understand, but it works. Uh, mm-hmm. So we have to realize that um, the, our perceptions of the world, the way we move in and out of uh, different circumstances is based on what we've learned either verbally or just through our DNA. And, and how does that, and so, and I'm, I'm glad you said that because a lot of times that, that, that historical trauma manifests itself in, in maladaptive behaviors. Am I, am I correct, correct, Dr. King? Correct, correct, correct. Yeah. So you you notice uh, that uh, for persons who experience uh, complex historical traumas, uh, there there's sometimes an inability to function in areas such as work, you know, or school or families in terms of being able to develop and secure uh, healthy relationships with families and friends. Um, it it lends itself to um, Persons uh, self-medicating sometimes, like substance abuse, alcohol use, um, or withdrawal from you know responsibility, and they they don't necessarily know um, that this is why I'm doing these behaviors. But there's something about the experiences um, uh, that they've been handed, you know, uh, that lends itself to being vulnerable to those kinds of things. We are with Dr. Lolita King. We are talking today about uh, historical trauma. She just dropped some really good knowledge about uh, some of the things that, that happen intergenerationally uh, with folks and what we see to do to adapt to some of these things that we really don't even know that's, that, that, that it, we're dealing with uh, as far as trauma. So, if, if 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 I was just and I am so I'm a person and I'm I'm figuring out like things are happening to me and then I I don't really understand why and it's and it's infused with with trauma. Are there signs? Are there things that 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 I might need to be aware of? Or if I have a loved one, that are there some symptoms that that manifests itself with, with trauma, Doctor King? Absolutely. Um, so. If we take a look at symptoms that are characteristic of trauma, um, you might be seeing uh, a person who relives the experiences um, of traumatic events. So that might be flashbacks, hallucinations, uh, nightmares. Um, Then the other uh, category would be avoidance. Mm. And that may be avoiding people, places, or things that remind a person of the traumatic event or event. Uh, the excess of arousal is looking at um, those mood-related symptoms. Uh, so perhaps you might uh, have uh, someone who's very hypervigilant, meaning that uh, when they're out and about, 
uh, they're constantly uh, checking their surroundings for safety um, or, you know, they're super alert. Um, I've had some uh, patients tell me that uh, immediately when they, when they enter a room, they find a, a space where they easy access out and that they right. never have their back to the door, for example. Um, there could be anger, um, fits of rage, irritability, um, difficulty sleeping, concentrating. And then there's also uh, this sense of, um, you know, a change in how people look at the world or view the world. So it might be um, nobody can be trusted, for example, or um, uh, thoughts that, um, you know, I'd be better off dead because um, there's nothing to live for. So it's a hopelessness they may stay, set in. Um, and then depending upon the traumatic events that a person experiences, there might be some uh, guilt or shame that is um, associated with that in terms of a belief that, you know, I made this happen to me or but for um, me uh, acting or not acting around an event, um, I could have changed the outcome. Um, and those are the things that need to be worked out um, in therapy, for example. So, Dr. King, I have a question. I know a lot of times, um, sometimes we see these um, symptoms, so to say, in different mm-hmm. people, you know, many different people that we may know. Now, mm-hmm. would you consider these, I mean, does it kind of go, a lot of times people look at it as mental health, or or could you say that That's these, a great point. Yeah, that it could lead mm-hmm. to mental health illnesses, or, you know, how does it affect, or how do they um, compare? Absolutely. So what, what, one of the things that um, I try to educate um, uh, people about is that um, what people see can only, it, it often is the tip of the iceberg. Mm-hmm. So, for example, uh, you know, we get labeled as angry black people mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and Absolutely. nobody considers what are the experiences underneath that that have caused this person to uh, react yeah, yeah. in ways uh, that may not serve them, but is the way in which they know how to express themselves. Um, and they don't have the word, uh, to, uh, really, um, be able to either explain it to themselves or others about what's going on in, on the inside. They're only seeing a symptom, but not the conditions in which created it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think that's we, a, it, go, it, sure. go ahead, Dr. King. No, go ahead. No, it, and I was just thinking that um, one of the things that uh, I've often um, encouraged uh, people uh, to talk about is um, what are those things that are underneath that, that other, that, that people, that go unnoticed. So, mm-hmm. uh, um, you know, what are the beliefs? What did, you, what did that mean to you, to have that happen to you? That's when you start to see people able to identify, uh, identify a range of emotions, not just those that um, get triggered uh, when a person gets threatened or perceived threats um, from their environment. Mm. So, they, and, so and making so- sense of that, labeling other emotions, you know, sometimes it's just restricted. I only can feel angry because that activates me, you know, um, uh, if it, it's something that works, you might hear, or um, trauma can lead to depression, right? Mm-hmm. Um, anxiety, you know, you're always fearful, you think something bad is going to happen. So um, it, it plays a big role in mental health. And um, there's a misunderstanding that, um, uh, that, that things happen and people just kind of get over it. No, uh, most of the time, people figure out ways to keep surviving, but that doesn't mean they're living meaningful lives. Yeah. And it kind of goes back to uh, self-medication oftentimes through drugs, alcohol. You might see domestic violence, but it's really a response or reaction to these cumulative things that keep happening, there and there's no space for people to make sense of it. Yeah, I think a lot of times people, especially in our community, it's just kind of people sweep it under the rug, so to say, you yep. know. They don't yeah, talk about true. it. Yeah, they don't talk about it. Or they're like, things that happen in our house are supposed to stay in our house and not go outside of that. So then, like yeah. you said, they do uh, resort to substance abuse or when they are out in the public and whatever it is, that fix that they got to have, that they fall to, okay, well, I'm going to get money then or, or I'm going to drink mm-hmm. all the time or whatever that high is for them, then it can become excessive, right, when they haven't 
dealt with these issues and problems? Sure. Sure. And, and, and also, you know, since there has been a, a stigma around mental health in our community, um, some people uh, believe that, you know, uh, that's air in their business or um, there's a uh, misconception that uh, people are doing things to you when you come to therapy. But it's actually just space, private, protected space where you can really sort out what has happened and what you made that mean to you. Um, we, we often uh, talk about uh, behaviors, but we, we, if we don't know where they come from and why we behave in those ways or we're not able to engage in certain things that would um, allow for us to be less isolated and to progress with our goals and dreams, then we're kind of just stuck in a holding pattern, just simply trying to make it day by day. Yeah, and that's and that's not healthy as well. Mm-hmm. And and I want to I want to touch on something that you said, uh, Doctor Keen. That's that's really important. It's like the collective trauma, and and I think what 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 people I want people to understand. And again, I'm not an, an expert, so I don't want to pretend that that I am. But I'll speak for me specifically. You know, maybe I, I don't maybe experience, you know, trauma at a, at a certain point in time. But when mm-hmm. I see trauma happen to our people all over across this country, yeah. I, I, I internalize that. Yeah. Right? So I, I internalize that trauma. So when I, when I see young black men getting killed by uh, you know, officers around the country, I don't care if, if they're in Chicago, California or New York, I in, internalize that. And I feel traumatized instantly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So if we take, for example, Mr. uh, Floyd's uh, murder uh, more recently here in um, Minneapolis, um, everyone uh, kind of uh, that I've talked to talked about that thinking, feeling up. Here it is again. Here we go again. And so even though it didn't happen to us in particular, witnessing something, in fact, even if it's not happening to you, can be traumatic. Um, But if we take the black community, we have already been there. And the body keeps the score. The mind keeps the score. So it takes us back to what happened to mom and what happened to grandma and what happened to uh, the, the, the persons that came over on those slave ships and the lynchings. We hold that in our DNA. And so if we're already set up with this hyperarousal that we're always perceiving danger, whether it's real or not, because that's what keeps us alive, then we are on a higher uh, likelihood of um, uh, being, being reactive, right, um, mm-hmm. and not knowing where to put that. So uh, we have to unpack that and, and, and speak to what, where are you sensing that in your body? Because we all hold pain um, and memories in different ways. Uh, it's not just in the memory but uh, it affects your whole system um, in your body. And that's why we have to be real mindful of the connection between the mind and the body and trauma and how that shows up for our people, which you will see more chronic diseases quite often um, uh, with uh, our population who has experienced significant traumatic events over decades. And I love what you just said, Dr. King. You said the body and the mind keep score. Yeah. That, that, that's really, 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 I think, something that's a, is important to acknowledge. And, and that's actually just very real. And this is such an important topic. Just unfortunately, we don't have a, 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 a lot of time. We could talk for hours on this. And I would love <laughs> to hear you speak more about a lot of this because it is right. really hit his home, especially in the times that we're, we're dealing with now. So mm-hmm. what I want to just focus on as we've got about a couple more minutes to, to go, uh, Dr. King in this conversation is what does healing look like for our, mm. ourselves and our community? Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, healing, uh, is a process. Um, and, uh, so I, I want to put that out there because, um, you know, we, we, we have a lot of people, uh, particularly in our younger generations, they're, 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 they want things instantly. And unfortunately, um, mm-hmm. healing, uh, it can sometimes be a, a, a long process. 
but um, it doesn't have to happen all at once. So you can get an understanding of something and it allows you to move forward. And then you come back to that and maybe you could do therapy a little bit later. But basically, mm-hmm. uh, healing is going to require that um, people have access to help. Uh, and that may be uh, physical health, mental health, uh, spiritual health. So uh, at North Point, um, all of our staff are... Um, have been um, trained in trauma-informed care. So what that basically means is that our providers recognize the historical barriers um, that have uh, been created in our communities. And so there is a awareness and a um, space for uh, people to come in um, and uh, we meet people where they are in those processes of uh, uh, gaining health. Um, That also can be again, doing uh, individual therapy, group therapy. Um, and so we, we offer those uh, as avenues um, and opportunities for people to um, get healthy in a healing um, and non-judgmental space. Awesome. Now, I'm going to ask a question that um, I'm sure many other people probably were thinking. Um, how many or are there other African-American therapists there that assist with this trauma or, you know, is it predominantly um, white? No, a um, we, have a, we have a very um, uh, diverse diverse staff um, of providers. Um, we have Hmong uh, speak and we have uh, groups that are specifically uh, for uh, um African. Different groups. So we have Spanish uh, uh, speak, and we have interpreters. So we see a wide range of people. Um, we have uh, at least uh, three uh, female African American therapists, and I want to say three four males. Um, so we do have uh, those that would prefer to see uh, people of their own uh, culture, mm-hmm. and so we do have that available. Um, availability. Um, But no, we have a diverse uh, uh, staff of providers at North Point because we think that's important. Absolutely. Can you give folks information about how to access North Point, Dr. Mm -hmm. Kim? Absolutely. Right now we're doing um, telehealth visits uh, via telephone and video. um, And also we have staff uh, that are um, on uh, site. And the way to schedule an appointment is to call 612 Five four three two five zero zero, and I also want to point out that we do have a testing clinic uh, for COVID, and uh, you only need to call that same number six one two five four three two five zero zero, and you can do the drive up clinic, or you can do walk in, or uh, I'm sorry, you can walk in to do the appointment uh, for that testing as well. That's great information, and I know folks in the community uh, love the fact that North Point has is, is, is been around and, and, and stayed there and has always been a, a big part of North Minneapolis. So I appreciate you giving sure. that uh, information. Dr. King says, I am so happy that you were able to join us today, and I appreciate yes. you uh, being on the show and, 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 and telling folks exactly uh, everything that I think was important around this time to understand. So, Sister, I appreciate you in, in having your presence on our show today. Thank you. My the pleasure was all mine. Awesome. Kim, what do you think about that? Oh, man, it was interesting because, like I said, this is something that our community deals with. However, we don't deal with it. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, there's so many traumatic experiences that have hap- that has happened in our community and to our people. But again, we don't never discuss it and we don't know where to go. And sometimes when we do go, we're in front of people who don't necessarily understand the environment that we've come from. So we don't never feel like they can really help us because they haven't experienced it. So I think having the ability to sit with someone who is African-American as well, or, you know, someone of your own culture that can, you know, understand where you come from and the life that you, you know, the lifestyle that you may have been, um, op- you know, witnessed, that you may have witnessed, you know, to be able to help you to get through it. So I'm happy about this conversation today. <laughs> yeah, I, I am too. So, and some of the uh, questions you asked, I just were right on time because you're absolutely right. So 
I wish we had an hour with, with Dr. King, especially with topics around this, because I, I think it's important. Uh, unfortunately, we, we have only to have bring a, her back. A, we have to bring her back. She was excellent. And I appreciate her being on this show. So, and again, I always want to thank you as always of being part of this show, sister. So uh, I'm appreciate glad you are well. I'm, I'm glad uh, to hear your voice. So same uh, here. Glad to we be will, back. <laughs> uh, and I know, I know the people are too. So Minneapolis, I want to thank you again uh, for tuning in. Um, Stay safe. God bless. This is Minneapolis 360. One love, kings and queens. Until next time.